Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ilham and this afternoon's talk, which is being held in conjunction with this exhibition, Lift the Tika, a series of works by artist Yi Ilan, together with her collaborators, weavers, dancers, musicians, filmmakers from Ilan's home state of Sabah in Borneo. And today's program, uh, it feels very fitting because of course, there's just been the Kaamatan celebrations in Sabah. So it seems absolutely right to have uh, Ilan here uh, to give a talk. And she's going to be speaking about history and power. And these are, you know, if you know Ilan's work, these are two subjects or triggers, as she, as she calls them, that she has really addressed uh, consistently throughout her 20, 25 years of history, of practice. So, <laughs> so um, Ilan's going to speak for about an hour, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Yi Ilan. Thank you, Rahel. And thank you to Ilham for having me. And thank you, all of you, for being here today. Do I use a mic? Can you hear me? Yeah, use the mic. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be here with Borneo Heart. Beverly, the curator, is here somewhere. There she is. Wave your hand, Beverly. Uh, it's been a, quite an epic two-year journey. So May of 2021 was when we had the first part, I suppose, of Borneo Heart in KK. Um, and we, even then, we wanted to bring it to KL, but because of pandemic and various things, it got delayed until now. And then coming to KL, it's been incredible to share so many spaces with so many uh, people who have spaces and the teams that they work with in their spaces. And it's the sharing of the mat has been really the generosity, including with Ilham, the generosity and the, the warmth of people uh, who have taken part on this crazy journey has been really quite uh, overwhelming. So I really, Thank you all for all of our venues, our mats that we've been sharing Born Your Heart with and with the audiences. I really, really deeply, sincerely thank everyone uh, for that. It's been, it's been um, an incredible ride. So I thought today, because we're sitting on a mat, that it was apt to start with some storytelling. So I'm just going to read your story because that's what a lot of the time, that's what I do on a mat. We, we tell stories. So we're going to start with the sto one of my favorite stories from Sabah called Monsopiat. It's this long. And a lot of what I do is I listen to the stories. And, I, and, I, and I, these stories just pull you in, right? And when you start to think it through and fill in the blanks, they become these incredibly rich ways of understanding our communities, really. So I have to pakai spec. So, okay. Once upon a time, there lived a boy called Monsapian. He was thought to have been bestowed special powers by a sacred uh, burung bungang that lived on the roof of his grandfather's house. The grandfather was the ketua of their kampung. The kampung was not happy, though, as it was continuously raided by others who were stronger than these villagers. The villagers then decided to train Monsopiat to be a warrior. He grew up to be a tremendous warrior who would kill all the raiders who came to his village. He would take the heads of those that he killed as trophies. Monsopiat was lauded and loved by the villagers as a hero. As time passed, Monsopiad himself began to raid other villages. He became boastful with the number of heads he had collected. His own family and friends became fearful of him. One day, the other warriors in the village decided to kill Monsopiad. They snuck up on him while he was sleeping. When Monsopiad awoke, surrounded by his family and friends, he found he had lost his special powers and he was killed by people from his own village. So I want to start, maybe a bit strangely, but it's about sharing the mat, what we might think of as power. 
Chito, what's power to you? I start with Chito because, you know. Power is me taking this point away from you. Okay. Because <laughs> we need to shift oh. the switch points. Okay. <laughs> but but what, is, what is power? Just, just shout it out. I mean, we all have a sense of what powers might be. Dominance. Dominance. Control. 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 The ability to do something. The ability to do something. Oppression. Oppression. All, all, I think, are power too. That I agree, yeah. Um, so because we're sitting here across from KLCC, I thought that I'll start with this image way back from 2003, so that's uh, 20 years ago. 20? Yeah. Also an exhibition called Horizon at Valentine Willie Fine Art. Valentine Willie is here. It was created, uh, cur curated by Beverly Young, who is here. So these people have been on a very long journey and I, with me with them. Um, but I also see power in imagination and vision. And I see power in the horizon line. Because to me, the horizon line is a place where you can't see what's beyond it. And it carries certain powers for me. And this piece called Fencing, do you see what it is? It's KLCC. It's KLCC, repeated, repeated, repeated as a fence, right? So when I was making this work, 2003, what happened in 2003? Come on, people. <laughs> Mahate retired the first time, <laughs> right? Before he came back again, right? So Mahate retired in 2003, and I, as a relatively young Malaysian at that time, who grew up with Mahathir, he was the only prime minister I'd ever known, mm -hmm. really, in my consciousness as a, as a sort of adult. And I wondered to myself what that meant to imagine a country without Mahathir, right? It was, it was quite jolting because I, I, it was quite difficult to imagine. And then I was realizing, because I also work in the film industry, I was at that time as a production designer building sets. And a lot of the time when you build sets, you work with props. You create environments that stories happen in. And then, it, then I realized that my anxiety that I was feeling about a Mahathir-less uh, Malaysia in 2003, when he was retiring, was that he had placed in my young vision, these props um, to give a feeling of well-being. I grew up with the construction of KLCC, tallest building in the world, Malaysia Bole, Vision 2020, we're going to be all right. And for a young person, I realized with a certain amount of hindsight that there was a seduction in all of that, that, that I perhaps fell into also. But what happened was this KLCC, this shiny, beautiful building, and I think they are beautiful, blocked my vision and locked me in. Locked me into um, uh, a way of having something that blocked my vision, that blocked my looking at the horizon line and powers of the imagination of seeing beyond uh, props placed in front of you. Um, and that, that moment, um, Beverly will attest to this, was when I started to think of myself as an artist. And the irony being, I started to think of myself as an artist when I realized that I'd, I'd grown up to that point with uh, objects blocking my view. And when I worked on Horizon series, and I was in the Australian desert when I worked on it, where there's an incredible horizon line with nothing, right? Um, that it was about the power of searching beyond and looking uh, to, the, to the horizons, to the metaphoric uh, conceptual horizons. And that started me, really, I think it was uh, in the 90s. I came to KL in 94, um, and I was very, very playful in those early 90s. We did the first three rave parties in Malaysia. Very playful, very playful with urban youth, um, which I'm, I'm very proud of, actually. Um, this was with uh, Nani Kaha from uh, Lab DNA, not, not myself alone. Nani was my main collaborator. Um, so I thought I would then 
with this idea of looking to the horizon and looking beyond what's in front of our faces, uh, beyond looking at the, the obvious in front of us, to start with this piece, which is a batik artwork. It's made with batik. It's, um, do you know what it is? Can you see what it is? I'm mapping the oceans of Southeast Asia. Normally, we map the land, right? What happens if we look at that, if you think of land and water, sea as positive, negative mass? So I'm looking at um, our oceans. We are the archipelago, at least our part of Southeast Asia, we're, the, we're from the archipelagic Southeast Asia. We're from the land of, of islands. We're from the land of the sea, actually. We're a corridor region between empires of the world, between China and India, between Japan and the Arab world, where the, this is the reach of those early Bugis navigational seafarers who went all the way to the Middle East. Uh, and I use batik crackle because what is batik? Batik is wax and dye, right? What is the wax? The wax resists. What is the dye? The dye stains. The dye makes a mark, right? So with, I love Bate Crackle for this frenetic energy that it creates where the dyes seep through the cracks when you crumple, when you take the two-dimensional plane of a, a, a piece of silk and you make it, you scrunch it, and it takes a three-dimensional ball-like shape. You dye it, and then when you open it up again, you get a, to me, it's like a map of energy. And these crackles, this textile, what do these cracks mean? What power lies in our geography? Is this osmosis, this transnational, transplace uh, fluidity in a corridor region where every, everyone is influencing each other? So this is made, uh, uh, it was printed in uh, Australia, the digital uh, silk uh, textile company that does Australian fashion on Chinese silk with Japanese indigo dye, reflecting also the transnational culture and the power of, tr of trade and exchange, the power of the, the osmosis. These are the ideas of power that I'm really drawn to. Right? What is the power of um, um, the history of ideas? If we, what is the power of transnational well, even before the concept of national, the power of the textile trade, of exchange of knowledges from all sorts of different people that, that carried eco whole economies. Um, so, so this is called Fluid World, and really it's, it's, it was a very important piece for me to sort of locate my gaze and the, the, the territory and the geography that I have become uh, quite obsessed by. Also, textile arts and batik is, is if we look at the batik arts, um, there's a, uh, a historic lineage with women thinking and women making. So often we, I'll, I'll talk about this later, especially with the tikka ribbon, which we have in our presence, but uh, um, textile arts contain motives that can be read. So when we look at the languages of Southeast Asia, it's, it's not just the bat, Batak of Sumatra, or the Bugis navigational maps, but also our textile arts contain language that can be read. Just as we're sitting on this emoji mat, that there's, you can read some of these, you know, we all share emoji languages. If you have a phone, you know emojis, right? Um, but so too uh, with the textile arts and the, the, the symbolisms and the motives that they carry. I'm going to speed up a bit, but I just want to locate us. So this is from the Smithsonian website. I'm from the island of Borneo, third largest Borneo uh, island in the world. And as I bombastically claim all over the world, us Borneans, we invented art. Because the first figurative paintings in the world were found in Kalimantan, Indonesia, not Malaysia, but never mind la, my saudara, my cousin, right? So uh, the earliest figurative, is not the earliest cave paintings, but it's the figurative art, 
was found in Borneo and also on the island of Sulawesi 40 to 55,000 years ago. How do we, how do we, what is the power in that? What is the power in no, no, our knowledge that through our histories, we, we are makers, we are creative people. And coming from Borneo, I, it's very tangible to me that we've always been, we, we make. And uh, we have languages that uh, there's a continuity within our languages to, to a time before time. And, and you know, my play company with Joe, my partner Joe, is there, Joe, is called Kerbao Works, because I love the Kerbao, you know, we would both love the Kerbao. And the first figurative art in the world was a Kerbao. So I have Kerbao in a lot of my artwork. I love the Kerbao. But what is the Kerbao? What is the power of the Kerbao? Why is the Kerbao on the cave? The Kerbao, how, like, you know, like I often tease with my Kadazan family, you know, if I got married, you know, you know I'm worth a lot of Kerbao. That's really mahal, 3,000 ringgit per buffalo. You know, I'm, I'm worth how many buffalo, right, in a wedding diary? So you, the, you measure the wealth of, you measure the value of a bride by buffalo. You move house, you have, you, you sacrifice a buffalo for, you know, there's a lot of storytelling within um, uh, these old knowledges. What happens if we start to pay attention to that and we, we, we begin to unpack it a little bit? This is another Batek work from the same Orang Besar series where I was looking at literal power structures of uh, governance in a way. Um, also of economic power, economic trade, uh, islands of cloth, islands of the textile uh, industry that funded um, so much trade during the early, early colonial period and onwards. And, and who were the people doing this trade? They were the privateers of the, of the, uh, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the English. What is a privateer? A privateer is a sanctioned, licensed pirate for a head of state. Buccaneers. For huh? Buccaneers. Well, buccaneers. Well, the private. The the. But the the the. Your freedom fighter is my terrorist. Your terrorist is my freedom fighter, right? So, although Queen Elizabeth the first had a bunch of privateers doing trade out this way, who were there were at? You, do you know where the word boogeyman comes from? the bogus men, right? So all these privateers for, for Britain or the Dutch or the Portuguese or the Spanish uh, would, um, they were licensed pirates sent out by the court, right? Um, and then their ships were jumped by these local brown people who would rob them of their stuff on their ship and they would say, oh, pirate, or they would, and, and, or they'd do it in the dead of night and jump and scare you. Oh, it's a boogeyman. A boogeyman is a boogies man. That's where boogeyman comes from. That jumps out and scares you, right? But then who are the boogeyman there? Who's the boogies man? The boogies man, it's not a pirate. He's a privateer for the local sultans or the, who controlled the trade entrepots around this archipelagic region. They were, they had their own Orang Besar, which were the, the sultanates. And the sultanates were the keepers of faith, of Islam, and uh, were, I'll talk about it a bit further, but they, they also looked after the people under them, just as the people under them looked after the sultan. But they controlled entrepots across this, this vast and fluid geography. And then we're going to make a big leap in time, because I'm not going to take you through the history of the world. Um, this is from Sulu Stories from 2005. Um, the only people that I photographed in this series the woman is from Sabah, and the man is from uh, the Philippines, but they're from the same family. They're the same, the same Bajau people, um, but they are separated by a border that was 60 years old with the formation of Malaysia in 1963. So the hair on her back uh, makes a map. Can you see the map? Yeah. yeah. Of Sabah, uh, Mindanao, Tawi-Tawi, Palawan, that frame, the Sulu Sea. And there's this, um, this uh, my, one, my other favorite animal is the turtle. So when a turtle is born on a beach, on, you know, it's hatched from its egg on a beach somewhere, uh, it, it scuttles to the ocean, it swims the world for 30 years, 
In 30 years, it's got a built-in GPS system when it returns to the exact same beach where it will lay the eggs for the next generation. There's this inbuilt navigation to where home is. So I think a little bit that way with the genetics of hair. I use hair a lot in my artwork because hair, like CSI Miami, um, carries, carries data, if you like. Um, so this, and with a very, very new border, our border, this year is 60 years. This is the 60th anniversary of the formation of Malaysia. Not that we've heard anything about it by anyone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, what does it mean when a turtle goes back to its beach and there's resort headlights where it, it, or the beach is no longer there? It's a highway and it's disconnected. These are the powers that uh, also appear a lot in my work in terms of sort of this uh, innate knowledge from ecology and from the, the natural world that also I think we can learn from, of, of the disconnection that humanity has unto itself, perhaps. Um, so this one is slightly biographical. Um, this is the, the, the creation story that we've just celebrated in Sabah of Kominodun, who was um, part of the the, the creation family, uh, I suppose, of, of Sabah. Kino Ingan, the, the god, and his wife, Sominundu, the goddess, they had a son and a daughter, the first image. Um, cut a long story short, uh, the community that Kino Ingan created started to disrespect him, started to disrespect nature, um, and were sort of breaking the laws of a natural balance of uh, the environment and the community. And he came back in great, uh, he, he brought on the seven uh, scourges, uh, famine, drought, plague, war. One of them was migration, which I found so interesting. Um, and two more, the seven. And um, he banished his son. Uh, and the, everyone was suffering in all these famines and the rest. And the daughter uh, went to her mother and said, sacrifice me, mom, kill me. Kill me. This is another story that is another favorite story. Kill me, and as you create mother, Suminundu, as you, the god, as you created earth and fertility, plant my body into the soil so that uh, all food uh, that comes from the earth uh, will be harvested by uh, the community and will save my community. And so the mother reluctantly but agreed to, to kill her daughter and plant her body, which became the foods. And every harvest festival, as of 30th of May and 31st of May, we just celebrated in Sabah, we celebrate Hominodun, uh, the, the daughter, for her sacrifice in order to save her community. I always think, how come the son got to run away and migrate, and she had to say, stay at home and sacrifice herself for her community, right? But you know, that's, but at the same time, it shows the deep connection, which I'll come to in a minute, about female power and agriculture as a way to save and nurture your community via agriculture and economics. The middle image, uh, that's my mum in her Air New Zealand bag, my grandmother holding me. My grandmother is Kadazan from Kampung Nambazan in Penampak. My civil service father, first generation civil service on the first uh, Colombo plan. My aunts from uh, Kampung Nambazan in Sabah. What they're doing is they're, uh, in real life, I took these from family photos, they're performing the harvest festival rites to remember Hominodun and the rice spirit Bambazan or Bambarayon during Harvest Festival. Behind them, the hill, Mount Kinabalu is on, in all three images as our compass to home. And the oil palm uh, is now replacing the land that is, uh, so it's a monocrop. Um, and then in the third image, do you know what building that is? Ministry of Finance, Putrajaya, transported and plopped onto the, the the landscape in Sabah. So, and the, 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 the earth that has been dug up in the middle image, it's the, that boulevard of Putrajaya is meant to reflect uh, uh, indigenous Orang Asli, Orang Asal patterning, but it covers the earth. And that's me, the buffalo. This is made in 2007, answering back. 
So it's me grasping to try, and, as an artist, to try and have a power, my power, um, to answer back uh, that recalcitrance that I learned from Mahate. I don't know if you, you, you when Porky thing called Mahate recalcitrant. Some of you are nodding, yeah. That's why I use that word on purpose, recalcitrant. I learned my recalcitrance from Mahate. Um, so then I question all of this. I question how come we, we feel so powerless in Sabah. We feel not in control of our destiny. It's controlled by Putrajaya. It's we're, we're distanced from our own decision making. Of course we're not, but we feel like it. So I've, just to go through that, so then I question that kind of power, the power of Putrajaya. And in 2013, I was lucky enough to take part in a photography workshop in, at uh, Langeng Foundation in Jogjakarta, led by um, an academic historian called uh, Dr. Alexander Supatono. He's a photo historian, and he had collected um, hundreds if not thousands of photographs, these are samples of them, from the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, their Dutch colonial photography of Indonesia. And then he'd invited 10 of us artists to sit around and look at images and to see what we might find in the images, what, what we might learn about our colonial history, what, what clues we might find um, through this uh, collection of photographs. And after looking at so many, what I got drawn to, what I became somewhat obsessed by, was the table. And everywhere there was this table. So I made a series called Picturing Power. There's very, very bombastic titles, cynical, sarcastic titles for each of these images. The title is just as important as the image. Um, but I made a very important realization for myself in understanding power. How do you colonize someone? And I realized it's not through an army of guns. It was through an army of tables. It was the violence of administration, right? And now you think of that in colonial terms, but you think of it in contemporary times too, right? When we, when we wanting to understand today's landscape, I'm not looking at history for history's sake. I'm looking at history for now to, to, to get an understanding of what we live through, right? So what is the violence of the table? What is the violence of admin? With a gun, I'll shoot you and you're dead. End of story, right? With a table, I'm going to send out surveyors who are going to make maps. I'm going to tell you where the fence is. I'm going to tell you uh, what minerals you have, what economic value you are worth. I'm going to send out photographers, ethnographic photographers, who are going to photograph you and measure the size of your nose. Um, I'm going to send out anthropologists. I'm going to send out a whole bunch of, of uh, academics. And they, I'm going to collect data. I'm going to make a census. I'm going to control the media. I'm going to make an education system. Think of it in contemporary times. I'm going, to, I'm going to, every part of your existence, I'm going to give it shape. I'm going to call it a name. I'm going to define it. So when I admin you, I admin you, your children, your children's children will learn this history according to me. And the violence of that just permeates. So to me, to, to, how do you colonize someone? by entering into uh, uh, this hard mind place that is intergenerational. And that is its greatest violence of what is lost in that process. Right? And to me, it was like, you know, I was like, I was like weeping with, the, with the, the power of the table. And it spurred on so much work just to, to address what, what this, what the, I, I, at, at that time, I wasn't even capable of fully grasping or understanding how to deal with the table. Um, it, was, it just became incredibly violent. Violence of the table, the violence of admin. In the Malaysian school syllabus, history syllabus, Sabah, Sarawak, and the formation of Malaysia share one chapter 
in our entire Sajara syllabus. We invented art. We have one third or oh, two thirds, Borneo, two thirds of a chapter in our entire school syllabus. I'm not talking about the white colonialists anymore. I'm talking about power in our Malaysian landscape of now, of why do we feel that we can't answer back? Because we don't know who we are. We, we, we cannot quote our history. My, my beloved Isa Lorenzo from Silver Lens Gallery in Manila from the Philippines claims my ass and the Philippines wants to, to colonize us. I want to do a territorial claim through the Sulu Sultani. But what about the Sabah voice? Why is KL and Manila talking over Sabah? Is, it, is this an empty piece of real estate? Do we not have the right to self-determination? Why are they talking across us? Why are the tables of these centers, this hard patriarchal power, making decisions about us? And we're never invited to take part in that conversation. It's always Kuala Lumpur and Manila. Don't we have a voice? Where did that come from? So, so this is picturing power. It's, it's brutal, hard, depressing as hell, the surveyor entering the land. And then on the cultural front, the topography of our mind, if you like, and the topography of the land are not so different. Here is our first monocrop, power of, of agriculture. Historically, Huminodun, women plant the paddy, women harvest the paddy, women sell the paddy at the marketplace, women are the spiritual leaders of the, of, um, the spiritual plane, looking after Bambazon, Bambarayon, the spirits of the paddy. What happens when women are no longer, so women are looking after agriculture, they're looking after economics, and they're looking after the spiritual well-being of their community and the storytelling that comes with that. With a monocrop, this one being sugarcane, the first monocrop in our region, women are dislocated from the land. They're, they're dislocated from their traditional role that they have. This was very, very quickly, it was replaced by rubber and now oil palm. So people often talk about um, the environmental impact of oil palm on orangutans. But what happens to women and women's role in society when they are no longer working the land, when they're no longer selling rice at the marketplace but buying rice at the supermarket? What happens to a society when the stories are lost? So oil palm is a really complicated subject, especially in Sabah where we're so dependent on it. And I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very sympathetic to the smallholders of oil palm because, you know, the, 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 their, their kids are going to university for the first time through the wealth of oil palm, so important. So you cannot blanket make statements I've come to realize about oil palm. But beyond uh, the monocrop Oh, the other thing I want to say, the use of land, the scale of things change. People never talk about scale. When you talk about the power of scale, the power of your home garden that you grow for yourself, and you, especially during COVID, a lot of people turn to home gardening. How powerful is that? You make your own food. Making your own food, power to make your own food, the ability to make your own food, right? What happens when the scale of land use changes from those uh, family or community run spaces until these corporations with valley after valley after valley after valley of one plant? What happens to your concept of scale, of food security, of, of all these things? Eh? Um, so this is what drives a lot of my um, anxiety, I suppose, in, in a way, but also my recalcitrance. I use the word again. It was a great gift to me from Mahathe to be recalcitrant. I will answer back, like you. Um, and this homogenizing plant to be the same. I want all of you to be the same. You are my monocrop. I will harvest you, right? So how do we, how, 
how do we address that in this horizon line where you want to have vision and imagination to push past the props that block your thinking and your vision? How do you get through all of that to something else? Um, which has been occupying me for a long time. Um, this is a 30-foot billboard. Um, they're all girl kerbaos. There's no bull in there. They're all female. They're photographed in Jalan Kampung, uh, Jambu, Bangkok, and Tranganu. A great effort with Joe and I. Um, but I made this in 2007, immediately after Brazil Rally Number no. 1. Uh, which I'm one of the 2,000, 3,000 people that was actually uh, witness to Brazil one, but it was remarkable because all these people were answering back. They were being recalcitrant to the recalcitrant, right? So I loved it. I loved the 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 buffalo that sleeps in the middle of the road because you know it's warm. I love the stubbornness. I love I loved these Malaysian people. Uh, all kinds, right? I love that they answered back. And, and, and this is, this is Brissy 4 later, but we, from uh, Brissy, I can't remember which one, uh, I think 12, I had this banner called uh, Rasa Sayang. And I love the words Rasa Sayang. Rasa Sayang and Nyat are my three favorite Malay words. I love the word Rasa. How the power of language beautiful Malay language. How do you translate rasa? Pauline Fan, in our upcoming book, which you can pre-buy from, <laughs> from Rogue Art, attempts to define rasa and def de attempts to define sayang. Oh, sayang. Sayang is performative. My sayang. Oh, sayang nia. How you say it gives it its meaning. It's performative. You lean into this word and you give it its it's, it's performative nature, right? So beautiful. And so what did I make it on? I made this banner on uh, kain sarong batik. Why? Because batik in the Malaysian context is a highly charged medium. It's a, it's a uh, since the formation of the Federation of Malaya and then Malaysia, batik has been a charged medium that is very, very close to power. It is it, you, powerful people wear batik as a kind of uniform. Uh, media departments, kerajaan, uh, kementerians on Saturdays are forced to wear batik. So what does that mean? The love of batik, I become ban every single day. I love my batik, right? So there's somehow now we go into the realm of a political kitsch. What does that mean? It is not an offensive term. It is Milan Kundra's The Unbearable Likeness of Being, where all of us in this room understand the joy of a batik sarong. And uh, powers understand our joy and understanding of the sarong, and therefore it can be used to trigger um, uh, a shortcut to communicating ideas, sentiment, feelings, and it enters into the realm of the political kitsch as defined by Milan Kundra, which I love that meaning of the political kitsch. So a lot of my work draws from that. It draws from um, mass understanding. We know already. We know the tikka. We know the batik. What do we do if we look at things that are obvious? It's not a new narrative. It is in plain sight in front of us. What do we do when we, when we we look at what is in plain sight, and we give it a moment. We bring in the, the vision of a horizon line to see it. So this, this is a lot of what I've been working on. Rasa Sayang again appears in the photo media uh, series called Rasa Sayang series. So I, I tend to repeat myself quite often. Uh, and uh, Rasa Sayang has come up a lot because I just love these Malay words that come from Sanskrit also, that bring in with it a history of ideas in that early map, that exchange, that osmosis, where you adopt language. Uh, other people's languages become our language. Um, so this one was also just very briefly about color theory, about how the power of color to play with the physical retina of your eye. So if you see these works, um, in person, 
blue and orange are opposite on the color wheel. So where they meet, the colors fight, they vibrate. And in that vibration, I see great energy. And when it's a hug between people, when I hug you, there's an energy transference. There's, a, there's an empathy, there's a, there's a closeness. So it's, it's like I feel that in this close proximity of a, a Brissy rally. It's, that, it's, a, it's, also, it's why I chose the words uh, Rasa Sayang for Brissy. It's not about the politics. It is about the politics but it's about the people there. It's a, a, a deep love that I have and a deep faith I have in the Malaysian people who are constantly proving me right, I think. I cannot have any, f I am completely nonpartisan. I, I have no allegiance to any political party because I reserve the right to bitch about everyone. Uh, but um, I have deep faith in them. I'm highly political, but my allegiance is with the Malaysian people because I think the Malaysian people actually know, they know. Um, give the Malaysian people confidence. Um, this one is another batik uh, triptych from the Orang Besar series, where I've mixed my primary medium of photography with uh, a newer medium for me, which is textile. But it's not just textile, it's the medium of our country, it's the medium of our, it's the language of our region. That's why I use textile. Textile brings in economic history, it brings in gender history, it brings in the woman's voice, women's histories. Um, textile is charged, textile is powerful. Textile ran the world for a long time. And this, what this sh illustrates here in these kain panjang, a kain panjang, John is here. John can explain a lot about the, 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 the histories of, of textiles. The difference between a kain panjang and a kain sarong a, the length of a cloth. If you're orang kaya raya, orang besar, you wore your sarong tightly and you made small steps because you're orang kaya, you're not doing physical labor. When you wear a sarong that's loosely worn, you can chanko and work in the field with your sarong, right? So the way you wear your sarong, what is in front, all these things are also coded, they're part of our language. So what happens when we start to sort of unpack that, to learn about the the social political landscape from which these objects come. How am I doing for time? Alama. Uh, so I only just get to the tikka. Uh, uh, that top picture, that's, that's me. My, that's my, a cousin, that's my sister, then me. And that's my grandmother at the door where you see her face, Dorothea Lonjain Bungal. And we're sitting on a bundosan mat the kind my grandmother used to weave. So essentially, I, after all this trauma of the Klang Valley, which I loved, I loved my years in KO, utterly loved them. But I got sick and I ran away home to Sabah, where I, through the memory of my grandmother's weaving, I, uh, that's my white mom looking out of place. Uh, this is in my grandmother's kampung. Uh, um, I rediscovered the man. These, so the top ones are land people, orang darat, uh, these specifically uh, Kadazan or Dosun Tangara, also known as, uh, and then the bottom ones are Bajau. Uh, plain mats are used for ritual, unembellished. Uh, pattern mats, this is Kak Budi's uh, uh, daughter in law. The colored uh, Bajau mats are used as dowry and for a Kanduri celebration, Hari Raya, Kawin, uh, the colorful mats come out in order to um, show off your heritage knowledge, how skillful you are, how knowledgeable you are, how much ilmu you have, right? Your, your, the value of your dowry goes up if you're a good weaver. And these are my Pulau Omadal uh, primary collaborators. That's Kak Budi, Kak Sana, and Kak Rosia. Uh, Budi and Sana are stateless, and Rosia is Bajar Tempatan from Pulau Omadal. Uh, with a heritage bajau uh, tepo mat, or the pattern, uh, which I've then transposed the violence of admin, that table, right? And here I'm looking at the power of the mat, the power of this rich, rich, rich cultural heritage with the power of the table that I've described earlier. So in a way, I think of it as a meeting of different kinds of power. I'm not advocating one for the other. I'm advocating that we see the table, 
we see the mat, we make choices about how we behave and how we make decisions. Um, and also, to rec I'm sitting here today on purpose. I brought it from home, my little table, because I recognize my power also. Right? So I'm, I'm, and I'm, we're sitting on a mat, and I recognize this power. So it's this, it's this constant uh, dance and uh, recognition of power, and being honest about your own privileges and your own power, and the choices that you make. So uh, my collaborators in those days were like eight, nine years old. Uh, you're going to meet these two. Dayang and Tasha, they're going to come to the book launch on July 2nd at Ilham Gallery. Put it in your diary, save the date, because you get to meet Dayang and, and, and Tasha, who I've been working with since eight, nine years old. So this was earlier this year. They're now teenagers, and we're still working together. And they've, they, they're saved. So Dayang and Tasha are Rosia's daughters. They're saving up for their university fund through their heritage weaving. And to me, that is another kind of power to, to, to draw from your own heritage in order for you to have ambition and to, to work towards something. And this was with Silverlands Gallery at uh, Art Basel in Basel in Switzerland, where how long was our wall, Lisa? 30 meters, 20, 40 meters wall. You know, I love a big wall, man. I'm, I'm, size matters. <laughs> you need a big wall. So the, I had a huge wall. Um, it was such a beautiful wall, wasn't it? And I'm there with all these really fancy artists. And um, with this work that I made with kids, stateless women, in Pulau Omadal, where the Sulu and Salubi seas meet. And ask Isa, we held our ground. And there were a lot of really fancy people, and they accepted us. They, 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 uh, and they. I think we were celebrated. I think we were quite a popular spot. Um, and it reminded me that we need to celebrate what is in plain sight. We need to see our knowledges that we have in front of us, and how we can make commentary about the world, and how we can claim our space in the world, and how we can be recalcitrant and answer back um, to other parts of the world, and say that we're important, and take up a, a huge wall, and claim that big wall as a billboard, and say, hello, you know, hi. Um, and um, that's what we've been trying to do. So this was, some of you would have seen this. This was at, uh, is in the foyer of the National Gallery Singapore, which claims to, whoops, which uh, National Gallery Singapore is a, um, uh, positions itself as the hub of modernist Southeast Asian art in terms of collection, writing our art canon for the region. So most of their collection, which I tell them every time I see them, is made by the colonialist. Where are our Southeast Asian voices? Where is, what, are, what are our Southeast Asian aesthetics? If you go into the language and, and theories and philosophies of aesthetics. So how does an institute, what is the power of an institution? And what is its history? Because museums come out of somewhere. Museums have a long history of showing off power. So when I got an invitation to propose something for the foyer of this very powerful building and this very powerful institution, what am I going to do with that privilege and that power? Like, I sat on that invitation for nearly three years before I decided that I was going to make a two-sided mat. Well, no, I didn't even decide. I decided I was going to make a mat. I didn't exactly know what at that time, but I decided it was going to be a mat because a mat is a platform. I haven't even talked about the architecture of a mat. Anyway, so, so, but because it's going to go to Singapore, it's now in their collection, it's never going to come back home. So before it goes to the institution, we're going to celebrate this mat at home. At the Lepa Regatta in Samporna 2019, those are the weavers. Hang on. So um, we show off 
because that's what you always do with your budaya. You show off to your own community. You show off your ilmu. You show off your, your, your heritage to, your, to fellow weavers, to, to the keepers of your, your stories, to your people, right? So it was really important that we did this um, before it ended up in the powerful institution. And the weavers who are stateless and can't travel except for Rosia um, got, to t got to share in the, the joy and the limelight of being the holders of knowledge of the, uh, and culture. And we also showed it to academics at a conference at the same time, the same weekend. So that the, we, we want to always uh, to um, play with academics, to, 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 to be part of their conversations in, they write, in the way that they write about and look at, uh, I don't know why, Chito, why is it jumping? Um, I am? Okay. Um, uh, so to me, it's really important to have that conversation with, at this conference, they're, they're discussing maritime issues of security, of all kinds of statelessness, really big issues. But to me, it's really important that we brought our tikka to them too and to bring in that, that um, all our stories, to remind these academics to, to locate it, their, their discussions with real people, real communities, real culture. And then I took the mat to Kenningau. So these are our collaborators. Kenningau are the land people in Sabah, the Dusun and the Morod. And where this is, is at Pusat Craft Tangan Sabah, which is the epicenter of the Sab Sabah craft production uh, uh, for, for you know, your airport basket that you buy at the airport shop. A lot of it comes from here where they train in crafts. Uh, it's really good facility with all kinds of, from wood carving to ceramics to pottery to uh, different kinds of weavings. Uh, and I really love this Pusat Craft Tangan. But it's making product for the market. I think what we did was we interrupted that and we brought in the power of play and joy of unknowing invention into this very important uh, institution in Sabah, very important. Um, but we played and we took our time to try and explore, to really, the, these weavers can weave in their sleep. They're so talented. But what happens if you step away from the mass orders and you take the time, and you take the power of time, the power of play, and you reinvent? You, you can see the result in the room next door. I think it is incredible weaving. And when I first, we first started working together and I was bringing them ideas to say, oh, Ilan, no, 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 cannot, cannot, cannot. Oh, you need to boleh lah, tak boleh. Oh, Ilan, tak boleh. And then, okay, nah, tak apa, kita main saja. Kalau jadi, jadi. Kalau tak jadi, tak jadi. Tapi kita main, try. And then they'll be like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. Wow, oh, isn't it fantastic? You're so clever. And it's like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like thrilled. I'm like, I'm so excited at what we're making. And then they're so excited, and then together we're so excited, right? And then we go to Singapore, and we hang our work in the foyer of the National Gallery of Singapore, and they're so excited. And now we feel the power. Now we feel we can make stuff. We can, we can show off. We can answer back. We can say we have skill. We, we have, we have, we're rich. We have stuff to say. And to me, that was really, really deeply life-changing for me. And I realized that it was also because I was not alone. And when I ran away home to Sabah, I think really what I was really doing was I was looking for my mat. I was looking for my platform or a stage to share with other people and to find voice because in KL, in the, the, I moved back in 2016, 20, by 2017 I had a studio. 2018 was that big election where BN fell. If you remember 2016, 20, KL was a toxic valley. I call this my Klang Valley, frowning. Like frowning at everything, it was toxic. I think everyone felt it. 
everyone. It's like, where's our joy? We are so good at being joyful as Malaysians. We are, we are really good at being happy, right? But we lost our joy, I think. So when I ran away, I was looking for that. And I was looking for my mat. I was looking for my people. I was looking for community to get excited about something. So the gift the, the weavers gave me was really that. They, they gave me back joy and play and excitement, a horizon line to look beyond the, the stuff that blocks your vision, to just push it away and just imagine something else. Um, I go on a bit. How am I doing for time? Oh, I got six minutes and 50 million slides. Uh, OK, the Tamu, my other major inspiration, which is, this is pre-colonial, but think of it now in contemporary times. A Tamu, a market, traditional uh, market of Sabah, is where the Orang Bukit, or the people from the mountains, people from the hills, people from the the hutan, the jungle, the river, orang sungai, orang dusun from the plains, orang laut from the seas, they would meet at the market, often at a river, because the river was the highway. And they would walk the long salt trails that eventually, across time, became our literal highways, right? And they would meet at this place. And then they meet at this place, because I'm looking for you from the sea. You're selling salt. I'm selling rice. I'm not going to the trek three days to go and look for more rice. I'm not looking for my own people. I'm looking for someone who's not me. I'm looking for the person selling salt. Or I'm looking for the person from the jungle selling camphor. Or I'm looking for someone that's not from my community. I'm looking for knowledge. I'm looking for gossip. I'm looking for love. I'm looking for a fight. I'm looking for all these things that are not from my community. I need someone who's not me. I need the other. When I have the other, I am fuller. I'm, I'm, more, I'm more whole. If it's just me, how much rice can I eat? It's tasteless without the, you know, the, the flavorings of something else, right? So to me, if you start to unpack what is in plain sight of our market, what happens at the market, what happens when you gossip, you know, I always say gossip can change an election, right? So what happens when people meet, and people meet on their own terms? And what, what, is, what is that landscape? Um, later, during, this is pre-colonial, during the colonial period, when we first got to know the different geographies of each other, I suppose. During the colonial period, the Tamil was formalized because, I guess, um, uh, the, the, the British, there's a reference here, I haven't got my specs on now. Uh, 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 the Political Econom uh, Economy of Stagnation, Britain North Bothing. That's a great book to read about the market. And it's, uh, um, it, uh, the Tamil was formalized under, under uh, British colonial rule because it was a way to, 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 to organize society. So even the British recognized the power of the Tamil. Um, some of these are Brit uh, colonial images from Sabah of the market. Um, this is SICC, Sabah International Convention Center, which is like a modern day Tamil. Uh, uh, convention centers are the meeting of minds, exchanging of knowledge, of trade, all of that. It's the same concept as a Tamil between uh, the Gaya Bay, Pulau Gaya Sea, and Signal Hill, where I've lived since I was a month old. So it's my hill. My family still live on the bottom of Signal Hill. Um, and it's between the sea and the hills between the, the sea and the land, there is the trade. The trade, the exchange of knowledge between people, the exchange of uh, um, everything, you know. Um, in Sabah, we have many demographics, really. But we have three very prominent ones from time immemorial. The Orang Darat, or the Orang Tana, the orang laut, or otherwise the orang ai, and then we have the urban folk, right? Uh, equally important, but set aside for a moment because they spo spoil the poetry of my storytelling. Um, so the tana, you all know, means land. Ai means water, or in this case, sea, as a compounded word meaning tana ai, meaning homeland. For me, uh, 
generalization. There's deep ra uh, racism, prejudice in KL between races, between religions, between those beautiful Malaysian people that actually are very fond of each other. Um, but there's this, this underlying current of um, racism between races, right? In Sabah, we don't have that so much. What we have is prejudice between land people and sea people. And this dates back to pre-colonial times. This dates back to those, the rulers, um, the entropots that controlled the sea and that big trade that happened across history, who would toll the rivers, who would disconnect direct access to trade routes for land people and the sea people controlled that trade. That's a very old prejudice that goes back centuries. And during the colonial period, that, that uh, prejudice, discrimination between these demographics was exacerbated. And every single election in Sabah now, you have it exaggerated again of fearing the PTI of those Filipinos coming in without ICs, that we desperately need them to look after our mother and yet we bitch about them, and yet we give them the intimate job of caring for our mother. Hello, people. Um, so to me, m my agenda also is to bridge this, is to bridge that prejudice, because addressing power through our histories, uh, we can only answer back to KL, or to federal as we call it, um, when, when we can speak together, as we can answer back to the Manila KL conversation. When we get our act together in Sabah, the Orang Darat and the Orang Laut, and we speak together to answer back, to, to fight for all of us. Um, and in order for Malaysia to work, Sabah and Sarawak need to work. Sabah and Sarawak are 61% of the Malaysian landmass. Semenanjung is 39% of the Malaysian landmass. Is that reflected in our National Art Gallery? Is that reflected in our history? It is reflected in our economy. We give two thirds of it. We built KLCC. Every Sabahan and Sarawakian will tell you that, right? But that you just take out, take all our stuff forward. How, when was the last time you saw Sabahan or Rawakin film in the cinema? When was the last time you read a Bornean newspaper? Nowadays, there's children's books being written, becoming read. Buy them. Give them to your children. Where are we on your landscape? Why am I doing all these venues around KL like some greedy, narcissistic asshole? because I want to get in your face on our 60th anniversary year of Malaysia to say, hey, we exist, right? Um, so, so that is this, 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 this billboard that we make. That is what it's about. Malaysia will fall apart unless we get our act together. Malaysia, we will take two thirds of your wealth with us, yeah? Sabah and Sarawak formed Malaysia. Where are the fireworks for this 60th year of Malaysia? Where is the commemorative crap? I want the junk. Where is the junk? So what does that mean? Are we colonized? Did we give up one colonial power for another? That is the difference. That is the danger. So anyway, I don't mean to lecture you, but this is what drives me as an artist is this deep question, are we still a colonized state? So these are the places I, I live in Kota Kinabalu. I work in Keningau with the bamboo weavers. This, the punkist video, the, the Landau hat, the Tukad card uh, from Keningau inland. This is the heartland of uh, a land people resistance movement from the Morot warriors. Uh, this is where the Batu Sumpa Keningau is. That, 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 uh, which is a blood oath stone that you should be learning in your school textbooks, uh, uh, installed on the formation of Malaysia. Freedom of culture, religion, uh, land in Sabah will always stay in the state. We should never have an official religion, never have an official language, because we have 30 something languages, which were banned and outlawed from media from the 80s not taught in schools, 
And then we, and then as Omadal is over here and Sampona being the nearest town. This is one route. Then you go past Maliao Basin, AKA the Lost World, or I fly from Kota Kinabalu to Tawau and uh, grab car to Sampona, or I drive the other way uh, via the Sundakan over the mountain way. So it's a, it's a lot of work for the last five years of being on the road. I just, I'm nearly at the end. But I really wanted to bring this work in because it's not been shown and because I work with stateless people. So the, this mat um, is the shadow of tables on what we call a kain palekat tika tepo. The kain palekat is a very, we call it kain, the weavers call it kain palekat because that palekat check pattern, John can also answer to that, is extraordinarily common um, amongst the woven textile arts and is shared throughout the archipelago, especially amongst maritime uh, or, or maritime linked communities. And then we've, we've put the shadow of tables onto that. And this was one of the early big mats that we made and the weavers were so proud of it. I said, weave your names into it, put your name there. So on the back, it's a two-sided mat. On the back, the weavers have woven their name and they also wove my name there, but because they are, uh, largely illiterate. It was the younger generation who, who made the shapes to show their mums what their names looked like, uh, you know, spelt out. Um, and then um, I, I asked the weavers to name the mat because like with a Chris or all these objects, if it's an important object, you give it a name, right? So Kat Budi named it. She named it Tepo Ania Nombona mat with a number. And I went, oh, that's a weird name. Oh, I get it. It's a mat that counts. It's a mat that's important. They don't have numbers. They're, they have no paper identity. The most important thing that they can give to their important mat to say that it counts was to give it a number. It exists. And I like tears because then I, then for me, it was a way of understanding what it feels like to not have a number or to not be important or not be seen or not be counted. Even though you sailed these seas for hundreds of years and this border is 60 years old. Right. So I just wanted to, to bring a little bit of their world into this space. And these are the weavers. Kat Rosia will be coming to KL for the book launch. And then to have, end on a happy, can you all read this out loud for me, please? <laughs> read it out loud. Friday night, MRI is on the Are you? <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to sing it, la. You're not under. You're reading it. You, what? Okay. What normally happens is I ask people to read it, and they end up saying, "Sing it, la. Sing the mat." Yeah. You can't sing, Chito. <laughs> <laughs> so what am I doing here? I'm working on the power of mnemonic device. I'm operating in your mind. You read this, and you can't help but sing it, right? And so what I'm doing is I'm actually playing with you. I'm playing on a shared platform of, of song, of popular culture, where you, you're operating a memory of something that's deeply familiar to you, and I'm providing you a soundtrack and music without providing music, I give you music. I mean, theoretically, you should have all burst into song. You know, you seem totally, you know, in my mind when I was thinking, what should I talk about? I was hoping you would burst into song. But, but this is the power of, of uh, um, kitsch, of, of uh, shared knowledge, and it's also the power of the tikka. 
it's why karaoke works. It's the most generous of mediums. You can be a crap singer, but you know you have such a fabulous, you know, time singing because the the space becomes really generous. And I feel the same way. I feel similarly between karaoke and the tikka. It's an architectural space. I think it's architectural. It's a platform or it's a stage that invites you to share a space together. And it's generous and it's fun and it's, it's exchanging stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I think karaoke is very powerful. And the why karaoke? Because wherever you go in Sabah, whether it's Paddyfield or Jetty or wherever you're, somewhere over there is Mariah Carey. You know, somewhere over there, there's you know some dangdut song. You know, you 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 hear it everywhere. But it's also an act of resistance if you can use it. So in our media airways, where where pop culture is dominated from uh, Klang Valley, these are the songs of Sabah that um, I hear them and I'm at home. You know the. To me, it's an act of resistance against becoming a monocrop oil palm. I don't want to be harvested. I don't want to be a monocrop. I, I love our difference. I love that we're different. I love that you're the salt to my rice. You know, I don't want to be the same. And, and these are the, these are, to me, this, this mat is a really special mat to me. As someone, as a Sabahan sesat di KL for 25 tahun, and you know you hear these songs for me, and it's 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 home. Anyone here? Anyone here from Sabah? Yeah, Valentine, boleh nyanyi ka? The first line. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then I'm nearly finished. <laughs> so I'm in the midst of making mats. This is just the year before COVID, 2019, and the last Sumatran rhino went extinct in Malaysia slash went extinct in Sabah. The one of the picture is Mr. Tam. He's the second to last rhino. Imam was the last rhino. She was riddled, she's an old rhino, riddled with cancer. But Mr. Tam was a beautiful, handsome rhino. And he died. And he died on our watch. And then I, when, I, when I remembered that my grandmother was a weaver, I asked my father, what did she weave in? What material did she weave in? He said, Bundusan. Ah, Bundusan. Bundusan to me is Jalan Bundusan. It's the name of a highway. I didn't even know the name was the name of a weavable plant. And he said, it's Jalan Bundusan because it used to be paddy field here. Now it's housing estate. Uh, and Bundusan was growing like, like weeds. So they call it Jalan Bundusan. Oh. And then I said, OK, exciting. So then I was looking for a sample of woven, I couldn't find a sample of woven bundesan. Then I was looking for the, someone that could weave it. I couldn't find a person who could weave. Then I was like, okay, I'm gonna find the plant. I couldn't find a person who would tell me what the plant looked like. And then, meanwhile, our animals going extinct. It's not just our animals that go extinct. Our knowledge has been lost. Uh, what is in plain sight has been lost. It's not appreciated, not read. Uh, so then this has become, there's an urgency to this that became personal to me. Um, Mr. Tam is gone. We have no, there's only something like 80 left in the world. It's gone. It's not coming back. So, so I, I do think these knowledges are really, what might we learn from them? That story I read of Monsopiat earlier, so he's a powerful warrior brought up by his kampong. The people that surrounded him in the end were his own family and his own kampong, right? What they didn't realize was just as they gave him power, they also took it back. And to me, that, that is a revelation in that the people always had the power. They, they always had the choice to, to, to act or not act or make a choice. And, and to me, when I read that in the Monsa Piat story about a kind of worldview towards politi political power of who are our Monsa Piads, 
And what are the people going to do about it? Uh, what choices do we make? So, of course, I'm going to end with my propaganda. Right? These are, this is called seven propaganda posters. They're a series of seven posters, each with a slogan. Mansao Ansao means to journey without knowing where you're going. This is what we've been, it's the name of the weave that we invented. It's in that room. Um, also, I want to stress that I'm not actually into identity politics, although people think I am. I'm not. I'm into smashing. Identity politics I see as a, a colonial um, construct, the census of defining people. So that's the flat in the box, make a mat. With the homeless people in New York that have a cardboard box, when they open the cardboard box, it becomes their tikka, right? That's how I think of the tikka. Smash the, the ghettos that we're in, um, get out of our, 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 um, our own, uh, share the mat. We are enriched by each other, by thinking, by technologies, intellect, ideas, the history of ideas that is foundational to our fluid corridor region. Um, and uh, that, is, that is our wealth, I think. Dam mahal. Mahal in the Philippines means uh, expensive. Uh, love, love, love. Sorry, love. mahal in Malay means uh, expensive. In, in the Philippines means love. So this dam mahal, this tikka knowledge is dam mahal. It's so expensive. It's our heritage knowledge. It contains within it so much richness. Our value system is not based, how do we remove ourselves from thinking of value in monetary terms? What is the value to uh, uh, the environment, the community? Our weavers, all our pandanos is regrown. We have, we operate on circular economic systems of restorative and regenerative principles. Oh, I forgot to say, it's written somewhere, the word, our word for table major in Malay, Mesa in Tagalog come from, anyone hear Portuguese? The Portuguese word and the Spanish word for table is mesa. We have a hundred names for tikka, tepo, banig, uh, apin. There's one word in the Philippines, in Malay, in Tagalog for table, which is meja or mesa, which comes from the Portuguese and Spanish word for table, which is mesa. It's a, it's a clear linguistic. Um, description, illustration of forms of power. So I'm just going to end with flip the table, lift the ticker. So ways of looking at how we look at power, how we understand our histories and contextualize them, um, different forms of power. It could be those hard things or it could be the power of the tikka, it can be the power of storytelling, it can be the power of joy and play. Um, and I think really that's what Borneo Han is trying to illustrate. And in a way that's what I feel saved me when I went back home in a kind of frazzled way with the effects of the table. And it's this sharing that the community has given me this incredible um, they've given me, a, they've shared a mat with me, and I think that they saved me um, in a way with, the, the with, with giving me a mat. And, and I want to share that mat with all of you. And how do we go forth from here? How the big challenge Beverly and I have talked about is how do we keep sharing our mats? Share the tikka, whatever it is. I mean, uh, institutions, how do you act in a more mat-like fashion and be less of a table? Um, all these things. I mean, how do, we, how, do we, how do we learn from our grandmothers? It's not revolutionary. It's not a new narrative. It's, it's something that, it, it's, it's, it's Milan Kundra's um, uh, political kitsch, which was about revolution, I have to say, but it was about, it was about um, recognizing our own values and uh, our own qualities, our own richnesses. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, so that's what really 
Borneo Hearts about, and that's what our it's covered a lot in the book that's coming, July 2nd launch. Pre-sales with Beverly, wave your hand. Yeah, CIE is uh, kindly helping us. If you would like a free, uh, free book and copy, uh, pass by. Uh, yeah. Copy. I copy. <laughs> and um, I haven't talked about the work in the show, but I'm happy to. I would like to thank Isa for being here, visiting from Manila. She's my gallerist. Uh, welcome to KL. Uh, we've been we've been on such a journey together. Um, it's been wild. So introduce yourself to Isa. Um, yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you Ilham. Thank you Beverly. Yeah.